Coming up on DTNS, Microsoft's AI is the best at captioning. Zoom wants you to hold all your events on Zoom and Clear wants all your data, just, just to make your life easier. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 14th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. October 14th it is, in fact, Tom, and I well, am at Studio September, Redwood. So I guess it's still Sarah Lee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Ron Burgundy. I'm, I don't know what time it is here, but I'm Scott Johnson in Salt Lake City. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. You can point the finger uh, at me. Joining, joining us, it says, is Peter Wells, freelance tech journalist. How's it going, Pete? Oh, hi, Tom. Yeah, September 14 is my birthday, so I reckon stick with that. that that's, that's quite why, nice. That's why we did that, Yay, of course. that's why we did it. See, it was belated. all... It was, you know, it was divine intervention. <laughs> uh, folks, we were just talking. Uh, Roger fixed social networking on Good Day Internet, so you, you might want to get that show. Uh, become a patron and get it at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Reuters sources say that Huawei is in talks to sell its Honor smartphone unit. Honor phones are marketed as budget phones. Digital China, which distributes Honor phones for Huawei, is reportedly the lead candidate to buy Honor's brand, R&D ad supply chain management business. Other possible buyers include TSL, TCL and Xiaomi. If Honor is sold, it will no longer be subject to U.S. restrictions placed on Huawei. No, well, that would make sense. Spotify is testing a podcast format, or is it? I don't know. It's some kind of format that allows you to use full music tracks while you talk. Uh, without having to obtain a separate license from Spotify itself. Spotify will let creators make music podcasts in its Anchor creation tool, and that would include the songs. Anchor creators in Canada, Australia, the UK, US, New Zealand, and Ireland will all have access to that feature. The shows can only be played on Spotify, and only Spotify premium subscribers will be able to hear the full tracks. OnePlus officially announced the OnePlus 8T. We told you it was happening, and it happened today. 6.55-inch phone, 120 hertz refresh rate on a Snapdragon 865 processor for $749. The OnePlus 8T is up for pre-order right now with a ship date of October 23rd. Dropbox announced Tuesday it's going to make remote work permanent for pretty much all of its employees. The company will set up Dropbox Studios, those are physical locations in San Francisco, Seattle, Austin, and Dublin, where employees can come to meet in person when they either need to or want to. Uh, those studios will be set up when it is safe to do so in the regions that they're in. Facebook temporarily reduced the reach of a story from the New York Post about Vice President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, that sources email and video from a laptop said to have belonged to Hunter Biden. Journalists outside the New York Post have questioned whether the information is framed accurately, whether the computer was owned by him, and whether the information is from a reputable source. Facebook will work with its fact checkers to make a final decision on the story. Yeah, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that with Justin Robert Young tomorrow. Uh, but today, uh, there's always a few more details out of an Apple announcement uh, that trickle out. Uh, for instance, the actual price of the iPhone 12 is $29 more than they said, unless you get it from AT&T or Verizon, right? It's $699 or maybe it's $729. Depends on where you get it. Little stuff like that. Uh, for instance, Apple also announced it will no longer include headphones or wall chargers with the new iPhones. We talked about that yesterday. Just going to get the Lightning to USB-C cable to reduce packaging, reduce waste, help the environment. But they did lower the price if you need to buy one. So if you need a wall charger or a pair of wired headphones, they used to cost $29. Now they cost $19. Interesting. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just mention here, I it feels like a weird oversight, um, but not, just not going straight to USB-C in the manufacturing of the new phone is really odd to me. I don't know what the actual adapter is going to do for people other than, since it's a mail connector on the one end, and another male on the other, it's going to adapt for power, and that's it. I, I don't know why they didn't just, well, I guess they didn't go that way because a lot of people have lightning connectors and cables now, already. I was just about to say that. Like, r right now I'm thinking like, oh, I don't know if I even have a USB-C wall connector, but it doesn't matter because I'll get a lightning cable. Yeah, right? I, just I, in other words, I can use an old lightning cable to plug into a new iPhone. If it was USB-C, I'd have to get a new cable too. That's true. I wish it was flipped the other way. The way I, I'm using USB-C for so many things now. I've got a Switch and an iPad Pro and all these other things that use USB-C. So I've got those cables and those bricks everywhere. Give me a, a reverse adapter that goes the other way. 
and we're we're golden. But um, I do I do look forward to the day where everybody's on one standard and USB C is rad. So my own personal opinion is drop the stupid lightning. Code. I mean, it's not just you, Scott. Uh, there, I had a friend who was, for whatever reason, he wasn't able to watch the event live yesterday, and he was like, USB-C, just tell me USB-C. And I was like, USB-C compatible? Mm, That's what we got? That good enough, right? And he's like, ah, USB. So, yeah, it's something that people care about. Peter, does it matter to you? Absolutely, yeah. I, I wish they'd gone uh, as soon as the iPads uh, switched to USB-C. I wished uh, they they would have moved across. And I think like a lot of the um, a lot of the criticisms they got about Dongle Town for their laptops would have gone away if the iPhone had moved to USB-C as well. Because suddenly, yeah, like Scott was saying, it, it, it's it's handy to have the one connector on one end. But if it's the same connector on both ends, then it's just the same silly cable that you have to have in your bag. You don't have to care what white cable that looks exactly the same that you're pulling out of your bag is it's going to charge whatever is in your hand whether it's your switch your android phone your uh, iphone or whatever so yeah i'm totally on board uh, but I, I don't think we're going to see it until I, I think it's more likely that the iphone will lose all ports rather than getting a usb C. yeah port. i think you're probably right what else we got scott sorry that idea just floored me you're probably right i don't like that either i want a little bit of holes in my hardware i want a little bit of place to put stuff and worry about water and too much dust anyway uh you can now pair two home pod minis to each other for stereo sound so you saw this yesterday and you were thinking hey what if those weren't together well now they can just like the regular home pod though a mini is a regular home pod uh, or sorry, and a regular home pod cannot be paired together for stereo. Oh, yeah, that makes me so mad. Yeah, I mean, but how about home pod? You got a big, and big, huge one and a little tiny one. It's a little weird, though, Sarah. You can like, still share music across them. The whole home thing still works. You just can't use the two for stereo. Yeah. And I imagine it's because they have different output levels. Totally. So it'd be hard to balance them. And this is the exact situation I was talking about Um with Terrence uh, from Snob OS on the show yesterday, because we're both Sonos people, it's the same thing. My Sonos ones are, you know, not deprecated. Some of my older Sonos products are. So there's only certain things that you can do, you know, when you're trying to create this cool surround situation in your house. However, the new HomePod minis, 99 bucks. Okay, you get a couple, make them a stereo pair. But if you if you, if you bought the original, which is, you know, a very nice product, but just overpriced in a lot of people's minds. And it, the fact that it is not compatible is kind of a bummer. Yeah, I would, uh, I want two of these, but I don't know if I'm, I hadn't even considered the idea of having them as stereo speakers. I've, I'm more considering this idea of put one in here somewhere. And when I go upstairs, it just sort of continues playing the shins or whatever it is I'm into that day. That seemed like a, you know, that's that's a cool thing. And other products have obviously done this. But that's what my purchase is about. But now knowing that I can do it in stereo, I mean, I don't know. There's probably some use cases where I'll do it. But I don't have an original HomePod because that thing was ridiculously expensive. So totally exactly. cool having the two little ones. Well, if you look over my shoulder, you can see one of the new Google Nest speakers, um, which sounds incredible for for its size. So I don't know whether the the little mini HomePod will um, reach that level. But yeah, Sarah, I, I was Sonos curious for a little while, but um, I found uh, that I, I got burnt by that that, that uh, the different compatibility, and so now I'm just a Google Home everywhere. Um, and I'm surprised I didn't set off the 17 speakers that are like within earshot of me. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, moving on to a little bit more Apple news that was discussed yesterday. The company announced it will include a free a th three month free trial of Apple Arcade for anybody who buys a new iPhone or iPad or Mac or iPad Touch or Apple TV after October 22nd. Kind of cool if you like Apple Arcade. The service normally costs $4.99 per month, and Apple will launch a bundle of services, including Apple Arcade, later this year. Yeah, so it's weird because you don't get it till after the first round of iPhone ship, so you have to wait. I don't know if this is a way to like discourage people from all ordering at once. And then at some point, there's going to be this Apple One bundle, so... If you have three free months of arcade, but you're paying for other stuff and then you bundle it all together, is it really going to make that much of a difference? But uh, yeah, I mean, if you're in the situation where you're buying after October 22nd, you don't want Apple One, but you do want to try arcade and play some games. Sure. Why not? Yeah. 
They also did the same thing with the launch of the 11, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I got three months free of Arcade as a launch product with that phone rollout. So it's been a year. Did you and, keep using it, Scott? Um, I did for a number of months and then canceled when things really slowed down. There was like a, a period there where they just weren't getting new stuff. And it, for a while, they were getting like two, three new titles a week. And it was like, whoa, this is great. I'll just keep trying this stuff. And I got to a point where it just wasn't happening at that rate, at that click. And I just said, you know what? Let's put it off for a while. Wait for something super rad to come out. And honestly, nothing's really jumped out at me quite yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the titles, or a few have actually, but they've been better on PC, for example. So I just go play them there. So, um, so yeah, like the, the motivation hasn't been there. But do I get a fresh three months if I get an iPhone 12? They didn't really get into that. And I don't think we know that, but. My guess is probably not. These are probably for new people uh, getting the phone for the first time. Uh, I think it will actually be for uh, older uh, people who have had the, the three months free before because, it, it, to me, this sounds like not enough people are using Apple Arcade and they, they want to get people back in to see uh, what games are in there. Yeah. Uh, and last little Apple follow-up, Snapchat said it'll launch a lens that will take advantage of that LiDAR sensor that's coming to the iPhone Pros. Uh, the depth sensing in LiDAR will let Snapchat place items in scenes at different depths. So if you've got grass, it'll be behind you. It'll look like it's actually on, behind you. Or on a, something on a table in front of you will look like it's in front of you. It'll also let things like birds fly behind real objects so they can fly behind your head and disappear and then come back. Uh, and, of course, Snap is going to update its lens studio uh, so that it'll, you'll be able to create lenses yourself uh, that support those LiDAR-powered lenses. Seems to me if that really takes off that... that um that phone and th and those features like it's it's already going to be a limited access phone not everyone's gonna be able to afford the pro but if those features take off i think you'll start to see apple put well they probably do this anyway but i think future phones will just have these camera capabilities this lidar capability and pretty soon all the if it catches on if there's it. enough of them yeah yeah it has to catch on i guess microsoft's algorithms can caption images with better accuracy than humans topping the no caps captioning benchmark Captioning model will be available through Azure Cognitive Services for any developer to use, as well as Seeing AI. This is Microsoft's app for blind and visually impaired users. It will come to Microsoft Office apps later this year. Once again, Microsoft AI, uh, better yeah. than humans at some stuff. And, uh, and this may not sound like much when you say captioning, but... It's the kind of thing that helps search results. It's the kind of thing, Ooh. if you've looked for stock photography, captioning can really help with that. It also will be in Office. You'll be able to use this in PowerPoint. Uh, so you could put a thing in and captions automatically show up or it makes it easier for you to find the image you want to put into PowerPoint. Uh, not to mention the accessibility stuff that you, you talked about there, Scott. Like, the, you know, putting it Ooh. in seeing AI so that you have more accurate descriptions of what people are seeing based on this, right? If you point the, the phone at something and say, what is that? Uh, this will be more accurate at determining what that thing is. If they, if they can roll this out to uh, social media platforms, this would be incredible for, for the visually impaired because how, when was the last time you, uh, you actually wrote up uh, a description of the image you just posted to Twitter or Instagram or Facebook? No one does it. Uh, so if, if the robots can do it for us, then uh, that will make uh, visually impaired people's experiences of social media so much better. That's so interesting. I didn't even consider the, the use case of social media. In my head this whole time, since prep show till now, I've been thinking, oh, well, how will this work in Word and PowerPoint? And just very baseline thinking about where Microsoft might integrate this. But as a way to, I don't know, put a photo up in Twitter, even for somebody who isn't visually impaired, to be able to say, well, here's this photo in France somewhere and have that thing go blip and tell me exactly where and what and all that. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. pretty big. I don't know if it makes us dumber because we don't have to look stuff up anymore, <laughs> more and more. But it's an interesting use case I hadn't really thought of. And certainly for the visually impaired and otherwise those looking for good accessibility features. Absolutely. Like that. You've blown yeah, my not mind. even just for social media, right? For websites right. And, and other images as well. I think sure. I think that's a, a that's a really good point. Anybody that's using a screen reader for anything would appreciate this being used. Yeah, because it just automates that stuff. Well, I don't know if any of y'all have heard of Zoom. Mm. It's kind of a thing. Tell me more. 
Yeah. Okay. So Zoom has started beta testing a service called OnZoom that lets paid lets paid Zoom users host and sell tickets to online events of up to 1,000 attendees. Up to 1,000 attendees. But you know that's an event. OnZoom takes credit cards and also PayPal. It won't take a cut of ticket sales. OnZoom is in beta though, which will last until next year. Nonprofits can take donations through pledging. Similar products exist from Eventbrite and Meetup. So Zoom is not the first venture to get into this, but they are kind of the big name these days. Google launched Fundo for YouTubers uh, in September, if you're familiar with that. Zoom also announced apps, apps that can integrate into the Zoom experience so you don't have to switch back and forth between apps. 35 launch partners include the likes of Asana, Atlassian, Dropbox, HubSpot, Slack, SurveyMonkey, Rike, and Zendesk. They have a lot of partners. Zoom also announced end -end encryption, which will start rolling out next week. That was something that, you know, it got a lot of flack for not having up until this point. Users will have to turn it on once it's available, but they can. And if everyone is in a meeting and has it turned on, a green shield will appear at the top left, letting you know your meeting is encrypted. At launch, if end-to-end encryption is on, you won't be able to use live transcription, however. Join before a host and a few other features. Yeah, it's the encryption stuff is, is uh, finally here. Uh, good. Uh, if you've got somebody calling into your Zoom, though, it's not going to be end-to-end -end encrypted because you can't end-to-end -end encrypt a phone call. So that's why they're saying, look, everybody in the meeting has to have the setting on, has to be using the desktop or the mobile client or a Zoom room uh, to do this. Otherwise, we can't end-to-end -end encrypt it. But uh, yeah, good, good for them. Yeah, um, you, could have, you could have, you know, if you're doing something in a corporate environment, you could have rules in place and IT rules and stuff where people are all end to end and you're good to go. So that seems like a good yeah. thing in the right direction. In terms of this on Zoom thing, it's interesting because I think it's in as much as others have already been doing it. It's a, it's kind of a response to what people are already doing with Zoom as their Ooh. as their resource. I've seen plenty of concerts pop up where they're like, buy a ticket, you get a virtual concert, uh, but the ticketing stuff is all handled through some other party or PayPal yep. Direct or whatever. And over here, you've got Zoom as the thing that's actually bringing you uh, the event. Zoom probably just said, "Well, why aren't we? Why aren't we the middlemen here? Why aren't we doing the entire process for that? There must be enough of that going on that they feel like it could be a, another space for them to make a little money." So, not surprised at all, and I they think it makes sense. Like I would rather do my concert in one one stop, no matter who I'm getting it with, and Zoom does too, I guess. Yeah, I, I um I, every Friday I'm on a uh, pub trivia quiz uh, because of course we can't leave the house. So um and that's over Zoom and yeah, it's this mess of seven different services that you have to jump through to get to the the trivia uh, quiz. But I I just found it funny the uh, the zaps the Zoom apps that that uh, they announced. I remember a couple of weeks ago I was listening to a podcast and they uh, tech podcast and they said you know uh, Zoom is really uh, drop the ball. They've, they've got so much kind of mind share at the moment, and they're not innovating fast enough to to uh, launch new products while while they've they've got their moment in the sun. And I thought, what are you talking about? Like, I'm on Zoom 14 hours a day, and the site has never dropped a connection once. Like, that's innovation in itself. The the uptime that they've got. Let's just work on that until we get through this whole pandemic thing, and then you can start to, to roll out some new services. And it's good to say that they're doing that. You can actually, you could also ask the question whether or not it will be as viable an idea if things open up more fully, because there'll be less demand on say performers who want to do ticketed concert style things over Zoom, they'll just do tours. <laughs> and, and and so if, if we truly are getting to a place where we can congregate in that way again, then this kind of was for naught. But maybe it's no big deal for them. They're just creating kind of a middleman processor and and uh, taking advantage of it while it getting good. Yeah, it's 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 amusing to me that that someone would be like, "Gosh, why Zoom uh, accidentally captured all of our market share, and and we all are sort of feel forced to use them? Why aren't they making more money off me?" Uh, and yeah, here they go. Uh, <laughs> I because because honestly, like this isn't new. The idea of doing virtual events and charging for them, as you mentioned, Sarah, there's Eventbrite and others out there, but it's because everybody has Zoom that people are like, oh, well, if I can do it in Zoom, then I know people will show up because there's hardly a person left, at least in our audience, who hasn't used Zoom at least once in the last several months. So if there's a thing on Zoom, you're more likely to go like, oh yeah, I have Zoom. I guess I could attend that thing. It sounds kind of fun. I mean, Sky, you could do Nerdtacular over Zoom. Yeah, we were. We've actually talked about it, or uh, we've been talking about doing kind of a 
from home BlizzCon like you and I did back in 2012. Oh, yeah, yeah. BlizzCon. Thought a little mm -hmm. bit about doing something like that. And and it is a format, as much as I hate their sound quality, that the video part of it is is covered. Like you can create a panel of 100 people if you wanted to or smaller, bigger, whatever, pretty light footprint. The use cases are are pretty obvious for it or for something like it. I kind of wish somebody else was more neck and neck with them right now. But maybe some of this is just they're the name right now. That's just yeah. the name they're you the know. That's, that's exactly it. I mean, yeah. it, you mentioned that the audio quality is not that great. Mm -hmm. Anything recorded from Zoom is awfully compressed. Trust yeah. me, I've yeah. I've tried to audio engineer a few of these uh, great interviews otherwise, and I'm like, oh my god, this is so bad. And there are yeah. other there are other solutions, but they're a little bit more limited. They're smaller teams. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's you know it's like cooler wave files, but you can only have five people at a time. You can't do stuff like what Zoom has been able to experience for better or for worse over the last year. I know that the company, you know, is, is definitely been constrained just because of the world um, and everyone needing to use it. But there are other options. And sometimes I kind of chuckle, you know, where I'm like, Zoom has become the Kleenex of video conferencing. Mm. You know, yeah. Yeah. You, you, have, yeah. you have lots of different brands, but you call it this one thing. Yeah. When my mo mother, who doesn't own a smartphone, said, hey, do you want to Zoom next Sunday? Um, that's when I realized Zoom was a thing. Well, folks, <laughs> if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Mediums 1.0 has a story from Dave Gershgorn about Clear. If you're not familiar, Clear is a U.S. company best known for operating travel verification programs that let you skip the security line at about 35 U.S. airports. Clear verifies who you are. So you do a, a thing in person, you prove who you are, they take your thumbprints and all that. Uh, and then when you show up for your plane, you just do a fingerprint scan or an iris scan and you speed right through. A lot of times you don't even have to show your boarding pass because that's associated with you through Clear. Uh, Clear also uses this technology outside of airports. They use it in stadiums in the Bay Area to help speed you through the ticket line. They experimented with touch-to-pay kiosks at the Napa Farms Market Concession Stand at San Francisco Airport. So you can just pay with your thumb by associating a payment method with your Clear account. Clear also partnered with the Seattle Mariners baseball team for priority stadium access and age verification if you wanted to get a beer or something. Uh, Clear partnered with Budweiser on an actual machine that let you take your fingerprint and authenticate not only that you were 21, but also pay for the beer. They say from the moment you put your finger down, you could get your beer in 20 seconds. Most recently, Clear has launched a health verification platform called Health Pass that combines COVID testing and self-reported status. This is self-reported status that is standard in a lot of workplaces where they're like, you need to say, did, did I have a cold? Did I have a temperature? All of that sort of thing. Uh, so they combine all that to clear people to enter their workplace. Uh, that includes Seattle's T-Mobile Stadium. Uh, where they weren't taking crowds, but they had people there for the Mariners games. That included the 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York, uh, some restaurants, uh, Chopped and Dos Toros in New York City. In fact, the NHL, the National Hockey League, used health pass for players and staff during the playoff bubbles that they had in Edmonton and Toronto. At a presentation last year, Clear CEO Karen Seidman Becker said, quote, you are your driver's license, your credit card, your health care card, your building access card. Why are you whipping all these cards out? So I, I really like this uh, piece on Medium because Dave Gershgorn doesn't raise the alarm and over sensationalize it. He just lays it out like Clear wants to do this. There's some benefits. Maybe there's some concerns in having a company know all this about you. It's kind of up for you to decide. Yeah, I've been super curious about it for a long time. And everyone I know who uses it, Tom, you're one of them, sings its praises. Like says, well, yeah, I mean, once you've done, it's like a one, it's like one password or any kind of password manager a little bit. Um, right. Yeah, the value of it is, company, right? yeah, yeah, if you trust them, then you've got this one stop, you're done. You don't have to think about it ever again. Like there is something to that. It's just all about the, the right company. And then maybe they're the right company, but. You know, is 1Password the right company? Is some other yeah, well, one the right what company? What I like about 1Password is they're not the only company. There's also LastPass and KeePass and Dashlane, right? Like, yeah. this is what I what concerns me about Clear is they're the only ones vetted to do a lot of this right now. Yeah, that would be, that's my big concern or my big hang-up is I, would, I need some other choice so I can see what one would offer over the other one or what one failed at and the other one didn't. 
uh, or which, which one got a breach and something t terrible happened and the one that didn't like we ooh, haven't enough, had, had enough time with it. I mean, that's the whole thing, too, is like what what is the you know, what's the downside of this great thing that Tom just laid out? Oh, everything is going to so much friction being eradicated from your life. Well, if there's a data breach or if the company for some reason has like nefarious reasons to use your data for other things, then that would be terrible. Those things do happen, but you kind of have to, I don't know. I mean, I am, I am on the less paranoid side of the fence when it comes to these sorts of things. Cause I'm like the, the just getting through an airport, for example, is huge hassle. Everybody hates it. Nobody likes it. You know, clear sounds great. I am not a clear member. Sounds, sounds wonderful, but, but just things like, yeah, go into a stadium when we all go back to stadiums, whenever that's going to be, but just, you know, paying for things, having your, you know, like we know who you are, you're in our system already. Just, uh, the least amount of friction is to me is worth it. Mm. And maybe that is naive of me to say, but I just, I feel like this is cool rather than scary. Yeah. So that's interesting because doesn't, I mean, convenience often wins out totally in the end, like, mm, yeah. but there's still this threshold and Pete, I'm super curious what you'd say about this, but I feel like there's a threshold. I don't know what it is for this though. Cause this feels like every egg in one basket. And as we know that phrase, totally, totally. you're supposed to be careful about doing that. Right. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, the, the fact that clear hasn't had a data breach, um, we haven't seen what that would look like, like how terrifying that might actually be. Um, so, so I think that that, that would, that would, you need to see that first. And I don't know, clear has never taken off in Australia just because, um, it's much easier getting through airports in Australia than it is in the U S. Um, I, I, I would pay for clear in a second or, or sign up for it in a second. If I had to, um, travel, travel through your airports, uh, as much as I travel through my own, but, or, or dude, did, I missed the, clear when I was going back to the Sydney <laughs> airport. I'm not going to lie. Oh, uh, like, look, oh, I'm man, not saying, I'm not I saying our it. international experience is a great one, but, um, for domestic, <laughs> it's just like, Hey mate, how you doing? And you walk through. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I, I, I can see, I don't know. I, I, I definitely think we need something like this when, when, if we're, if we're talking about, opening up stadiums again. And, you know, I miss the footy so much. I want to go see a football game again. Um, I, I will I will let my retina be scanned. I'll let someone poke my nose. I don't care if it means I can get to see my football games again. Um, I'll do all of it. So I'm probably going to just sign away anything if it means that I can see football again. Um, <laughs> and, and I would imagine a lot of people are in that same situation. Well, if you have thoughts on this or anything else we talked about on the show, join our Discord. It's a great group in there, and you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Norm from Pleasant Visalia. Well, good to hear that, Norm. Uh, was talking about some iPhones that we talked about yesterday. Quite a few form factors. Norm says, I'm a fan of the small form factor, so I thought the iPhone SE was my way to stay in this way. As a result, I'm kind of disappointed that the iPhone 12 mini has come out even smaller than the SE that came out just last year and only slightly larger than the first gen iPhone SE from 2016. After over four years without a small form factor, we get two in two years. <laughs> the new mini is 300 more than the SE, so I might have skipped regardless, but I'm still a bit bummed. I guess the positive is that Apple will be producing a budget model, the SE, and a smaller version of their flagship model next year. So maybe the iPhone 13 mini will be my next phone. Yeah, Norm, I I, I, you and you and a million others are feeling the same pain of like, wait, uh, you came out with a new thing, not let you know that that long after I bought the last thing. Like, the, it's a never-ending uh, peril, isn't it? I'm really excited for the uh, mini though because I I played with the SE when it came out. I got a review unit for a little week, uh, a few weeks, and um, it. it is uh it is still the older form factor it is still a uh you know not the best internals all that kind of stuff what the mini is is just as good an, a phone as all of the giant surfboard sized phones um but one that i can actually use in my tiny little hands so i yeah. I, I can't wait <laughs> yeah it's funny because this is the time i'm thinking about going for the monster one because even though seven inches sounds insane like insane that's a, it's basically a small television in my hand um, I have big hands and, they, and I benefit from a larger phone and my eyes aren't getting any younger. I can tell you that. So for me, 
I'm, I want to go big now, but I get the value or the uh, interest people are having in going back to a smaller form factor, especially with all the features. This thing's a, you know, uh, spec for spec. It's the same phone minus the size, and I, I think that's actually pretty cool. Well, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Dale McCahey, Ali Sanjabi, and Paul Thiessen. Also, big, big thanks to Peter Wells for being with us today. Peter, it's been too long. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm just Peter Wells over on the Twitters. Um, but I did want to mention uh, Meta is a new podcast uh, that's been out for a couple of weeks now. I've had some great guests like uh, Kara Swisher, um, who is one of my all-time fave uh, tech journos. Uh, we've we've had some great conversations, and it's just a it's a podcast about podcast, hence the name. But really, if I'm being honest, it's just an excuse for me to chat to people I like, because uh, I assume that by 2021, everyone will have a podcast, so I'll get to be able to chat to whoever I want to. Yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. Uh, so yeah. check it out. It's yeah. called Meta. Got right? Mm -hmm. M E T A. That's that sounds great. Yeah, good stuff. Always like a new podcast. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson. Scott, what's been going up on in your world? Well, speaking of the new podcast, the Current Geek Chronicles Season 1 ends today with the release of Episode 8 actually came out yesterday. So if you are interested in checking out what our final episode of the season is, we'll have some bonus stuff coming up. But uh, go check it out. We talk about mocap and CGI and the movies and TV and what's new, what's different, what might change, what might never change. That's at currentgeek.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, folks, if you want an ad-free feed of DTNS, support us on Patreon. to Get your own personal RSS feed supported directly by you. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. You want to send us an email? Well, guess what? We have an email address, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We'd love to hear from you. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more, tell a friend, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>